trumped that type of thinking. Unfortunately, that part which has to do with local participation is a function of your local content policy. As I understand, a local content policy is three years late. This morning I had the energy spokesperson of the energy ministry say, it's not deliberate, it's just a few knots that have to be tied. Just as with every policy that demands, uh, that must go with certain projects or certain uh, outcomes. Unfortunately, we tend to waste a lot of time. You could talk about the Freedom Information Bill. Uh, I was working at the Institute of Economic Affairs when, if I was one of, I think I was the first program officer to uh, have a post that program on the public, at the Freedom, Freedom Information Bill. I was amazed to find out that after I've left the IE and established my think tank, we're still talking about the Freedom of Information Bill almost 11 years afterwards. So it's not surprising that three years, uh, I do hope that within the next couple of months, the local content bill would be passed because that is what, unfortunately, politicians would hide under and then give projects to foreigners. Usually when you read this contract, there's always a function, which there's always an aspect that tells you that, well, somehow, uh, especially because you're guaranteeing these loans, even for private part, uh, participation, uh, there must be some some aspect of it that must allow for local participation. As I note, I was going to give a few examples. You see, I mean, the president just cut short for the 5,000 housing units. Um, and I think it's commendable. It's a very good thing. But on the very day, he did say that there are other 5,000 left uncompleted under the Aswell administration and that they were thinking about how to raise money to construct it. But the other 5,000 that the sun has been cut as a function of a Brazilian consortium. And so, possibly, that must be done before all others. During the elections in 2012, I was traveling on the Eastern Corridor Road. I'm from the Volta region. And I realized that some Chinese constructors had come to park. Uh, they had all the equipment there. And so back in my village, people were like, wow, this is good news. I know this time the Volterians will not be left out of their pie. I mean, that's cake. So well, that's fine. After the elections, um, the guys parked and left. I don't know where they are. And then I reminded them that my dad told me that the feeder route from Lulubi Kumasi, where I come from, to Hawaii district, I mean, Hawaii uh, itself, had been awarded a contract in 1979. That's three years after I was born. Now, that route has not seen any serious transformation since 1979. So, there are a number of issues. I don't want to go into many of them. But just to say that, you know, again, it's agreed that road transportation accounts for over 95% of all transport supply in Ghana. Um, this is data incidentally uh, also supplied by the World Bank. I'm just going to look at the projects, timelines, and implementation schedule. Um, Professor has already highlighted the importance of route to the economy. And I recall that about two years ago, the World Bank asked Imani to undertake a comprehensive study of what Africans really wanted. Uh, because they didn't want, they, they wanted to graduate from this whole idea of Washington telling every African country what to do. Uh, this was called the Africa Action Africa Action Plan. Now, essentially what it did, or what we did, was that there were consultations that were held at 40 African countries, and all of all we had to do in Accra here was to visit a few countries, but crucially, through a matrix, rank and other priorities, what Africans wanted. These consultations occurred between, or took place between uh, the private sector, the politicians, you see the uh, government, and then the civil society. 
it was interesting after doing all the ranking um, you would have been uh, were amazed to know that trade was the most important thing that Africans wanted and closely related to that was road construction infrastructure so as the professor said and it is true that when roads are constructed obviously the economy is opened up and the multiply effect in an economy cannot be quantified or can be quantified but in this case I mean the uh, the benefits are quite incalculable well so what are some of the projects big pro transformational projects that haven't met certain timelines because as I understand um, we are supposed to be talking about the public perspectives first of all according to the World Bank there are a number of projects there are three ongoing projects in the transport sector the Ghana Urban Roads Transport Project, the Ghana Transport Sector Project, and the Abidjan Lagos Street and Transport Facilitation Project. So under the first one, the Ghana Urban Transport Project, the objectives were to improve mobility in certain selected uh, municipalities through a combination of traffic engineering measures, management improvements, regulation of the public transport industry, and implement implementation of a bus rapid transport system. Uh, that project became effective in 2007 and it was expected to close by 31st December 2012. Well, it's been postponed to 15 December 2014. Uh, I don't know why December seems to be uh, very <laughs> an interesting month. Now, two routes were identified to benefit from the bus rapid transport system. The entire project has since been scaled down because of insufficient funds. At least that's what we understand and the fact that the infrastructure was running ahead of the institutional reforms required needed to manage the facility. The other project is the Department of Urban Rules, which consists essentially of re rehabilitation of arterial roads, so the Bermakam Road and the Gifat Road. I think for those ones, uh, uh, some work has been ongoing, and uh, the project started in 2009, and it's expected to complete in 2015. Again, well, there's a report in, 20, in August 2013 which indicates that there's a lack of funding which is likely to affect that particular project as well. Now, let me just say that with all this, some of these projects that I've mentioned, usually from the World Bank's perspective, it's not a function of insufficient funds. There's always the inability of the powers that be, well, the bureaucrats as well, and the various ministries, just to yield to timelines or to yield to the terms of reference in trying to draw those monies. You, remember, you recall that not long ago, the World Bank published a list of projects. They actually mentioned that uh, there was a staggering amount of uh, a billion, $1.5 billion that were still sitting in their vaults. I can understand that the disbursement rates sometimes are quite low. About two years ago, the disbursement rates on uh, the World Bank approved funds was as low as 12%. And that is worrying, actually between 5 and 12%. And that was quite worrying. So um, the point is that, yes, funding may be an issue if we have to rely on, rely on donors. But most of them is a function of our inability to assess this funds that are already uh, approved. Let me just say that um, you would expect that the public would be happy when roads are constructed. But then there are a number of um, obstructions, indeed, there are a number of uh, problems that come with these roads, significantly delays. Uh, just imagine that the whole community could be shut down between the Tekwashi and Legon for almost 10 years. And 10 years is enough to destroy that community, cause so much pollution in the residential area, destroy several businesses and livelihoods. 10 years in road construction is long enough to kill <laughs> lots of people. So I think that from the public's perspective, when these roads are constructed, we need to take these things into consideration. There's also the point that has to be made. Uh, the adherence of safety, con uh, the, the, the adherence, sorry, safety concerns, lack of details, alternative routes and notices, and 
all of that. And this does not just apply to local contractors alone. I think as a function of the industry, uh, I mean, happiness in the industry, I can go on, but it looks to me also that the one important point when it comes to road construction has to do with the engagement process uh, that should normally happen. I mean, every project must have uh, must have the what I call the social inclusive factor. Essentially, you've got to speak to people who are likely to be affected by the roads so that they can understand what is being done in most of these cases. I did hear that, well, there's always the issue, I'm coming back to the issue of insufficient funds. Um, it looks to me that the public is always eager to pay a little bit for some of these projects as well. I don't think we are exploring enough the idea that the private sector should also be asked to construct roads naturally uh, demand tools or yeah, demand taxes from them. I don't think it's only the government that should be should have the duty of constructing roads and exacting road tools, which sometimes have come under serious scrutiny. So people pay a lot of road tools but usually wouldn't find that um, there is there's a corresponding improvement in the road situation. You recall the Ashama situation when uh, IRATU had to uh, block roads and then burn a few ties, it was called Ashama Spring. All of a sudden, uh, the road was fixed. So I think that for me, I mean, uh, public perspectives is really a function of what we expect in terms of value, uh, in terms of uh, timely delivery of some of these important projects. As I said, all we are concerned with at the money is value for money analysis, cost benefit analysis, vested interest analysis. And I think that when constructors, contractors are complaining, local contractors are complaining about the inability to get contracts, it's always, it's always has been a function of vested interest because as it were, some people must benefit uh, at the end of the day. I think that there are a number of things that I could say. I don't want to bore you too much. There's a lot that has to be said, which I think have been said already. Uh, I'll end here and then uh, sit through some of the, uh, listen to some of the questions and hopefully apply, give some answers. Thank you. the uh, consultant supervision was top class um, and I agree completely and that is what we need to be doing. As I said, uh, we all need to be perpetually vigilant. It's only when you are perpetually vigilant that you get things right. So it takes the time, it takes the contractor and the consultant and these days, what I hear our minister saying is that there's no bad contractor. So there's no bad contractor here. What he keeps saying is that there are, there are, there are uh, bad uh, consultants. And that's why we end up with the bad roads. Uh, but the impression, real impression I want to correct is that apart from the, uh, the Americans who give us this money, uh, they are the ones who do all the time. The others really also do. The World Bank, the EU, the EU and uh, the, the rest, they always have their own uh, consultants also looking over the shoulder of the uh, supervision, supervision consultant. So they actually really, really look. And concerning local participation in projects, uh, as I said, it, it will take all of us together to fight this battle. To take the association and then to take the ministry because we also need support. You know, the ministry I know, for instance, uh, if you consider the upcoming project of the, the, the new water bridge that will be constructed uh, in a few years' time uh, near Bolivo, 
the ministry is pushing to try and get uh, uh, local uh, participation. And uh, we've been talking to the Japanese about this. The Japanese uh, are considering to uh, fund it. So uh, we are beginning there, and I think we'll be making progress. The Eastern Corridor contractors, uh, the Eastern Corridor, I have to say, is the road starting from Tema and going through Esukuma, through Hawaii, Jasuka, Kwanta, uh, all the way to Kulungu, through Misika. So uh, there are contractors along the way. This one, they have not left. So they will be back uh, maybe from time to time, you might begin to find them there. The real issue is that the ones who started in the southern and uh, we have a little challenge with uh, pay paying them, and that really is a problem. But if you go further up, you see that the one, there's a section from Dodi Pepesu to Kwanta, that is EU funded, the contractors are there. There's a section uh, where some Chinese are working. We have Brazilians doing 209 kilometers all the way to Kulungu. They are uh, in the process of uh, mobilizing. So you have contractors working all the way. And Lolo Road, I ordered in 1979. Jeez. <laughs> I believe that uh, when I worked in the Volta region, I might have also awarded some contracts on the Lolo Road. So, and that was in the 90s. But uh, I think uh, one has to look at the, the scope of works which, under which the contractor is to work. Maybe it might just be a grading contract, it might just be a graveling contract. In those days, uh, I don't think even the road from uh, uh, Sukuma upward had been tarred. So Lolo being there, I doubt whether I would be putting tar there. So um, really, I think that uh, it was just a scope of words. And that uh, we, we hope that when we begin to do our things correctly, we'll be able to do the Lolo road and make uh, Frank very happy, Mr. Kujo very happy. <laughs> uh, then the, I completely agree with you with the issues of timely execution, uh, value for money, uh, cost benefits, and the safety concerns, and all of that. I mean, these are things that uh, really the ministry take very, very seriously. And. Uh, uh, if you look at, for instance, now we have the uh, Kwame Nkrumah interchange, and we have a lot of uh, agitation uh, when the, some kiosks were demolished. Uh, there has been a social interaction along the line, but I remember a meeting uh, of stakeholders was called at uh, the church in the area. Is it Calvary Baptist? Yeah. yeah. I remember that, and all, uh, all the stakeholders were invited there. So it's just the way that uh, we do our things sometimes in this country, where people uh, are, are called to, to deliberate on issues, and after a few years they say they didn't know. Or sometimes they don't even have the authority to be where they are, but because we don't enforce you know, the, the rules of uh, making sure that people who are sitting where they are sitting have the legal right to sit there, uh, they, they, uh, they become uh, squatters and then they legitimize their sitting there and, they, and it becomes a problem, a problem along the, the way. Uh, then also Ashama Spring. <laughs> in fact, the ministry has done a lot of work in Ashama. You know, and it is that just that, you know, uh, the, uh, because we have challenges with payment and we couldn't started agitating. But if you look at places like Lolobi, like uh, uh, Tumu areas, which are very, uh, the pop, where the profit of the population is, and the one feet living in Ashama, and wanting all the money to come to Ashama, you realize that they are being a little bit unfair. We also have to, you know, uh, provide the road infrastructure for our people in the rural areas, you know. So, uh, as Mr. Kujo said, we have to 
consider how we share the I think I'll end here. Thank you very much. Any more questions? Foreign, foreign companies, and uh, it tends not to award it mainly to the, the most of the local contractors and tend to get most of the local smaller roads. Um, how does the ministry tend to look into the process of awarding? How, how is it basically the majority of the m main contracts are given to many foreign contractors? How, how do you uh, make the assessment? a quick one. Um, well, this morning I was on radio call with the minister, former minister for works and housing, actually the deputy minister for works and housing as well. Uh, this same question was asked and he said, well, you know, listen, if we go for these loans, you cannot dictate to the person giving you the loan as to what you do. So you have to allow that to happen. But I suspect that once you are guaranteeing the loan, you know, as a government, once you are guaranteeing the loan, it's about negotiations. And I've seen some negotiation, <laughs> negotiating uh, prowess of uh, some of our people. I remember during the Kufu era, uh, during trade negotiations, uh, most African ministers at the time, this was Hong Kong 205, when we were talking serious issues of subsidies and how to go around it, and Africa had to make a stronger case remove all these cotton subsidies and all these subsidies that affect us. Unfortunately, the African minister sat through and said, well, listen, we can help it. Give us something in return. That was where the whole idea of aid for trade came up. So give us something and forget about all these other issues. You know, and I was sad. I mean, these were young guys of Harvard, uh, boys who had read every bit of the, uh, the contracts who were dribbling our ministers. At the point, they just raised their hands and said, well, forget it. It's also a function of the people who do these negotiations. I think people like this, I'm not saying that the minister does not know. I mean, he's an accomplished uh, professional. But in most of the ministries, you will be surprised that the ministers, have, and they are not supposed to have any clue most of the time, but in terms of directions. But they are the first to jump on the plate when these negotiations are supposed to be held. And totally do not understand. It was a funny story. One contractor, foreign contractor, shared with me that all they did was they allowed the minister to go around the city and to take photos. They gave him a nice camera. <laughs> By the time he came, the deal had been done. So it's a function of the people. It, it is not a situation where you can say, all oh, those people give us the money, so they have to decide everything. No, it doesn't work that way. Especially when these projects are over land, which you hope. And um, when I said that the USAID well the, well, the USAID or the Millennium Challenge account uh, didn't want any interference and wanted to uh, project, uh, I mean, um, graduate the delivery of this money according to schedule and um, works and all of that. Uh, I didn't mean to necessarily say that the others did not have any oversight. Of course they didn't have any oversight. The point is that the Americans have decided that they will no longer do budget support. I think that's a statement, it's a big statement. And so for the N1 highway, the point I was making is that can we learn any lessons? Because it was effectively done, even though there were other issues as well, of course, people are dying and all of that. Um, so I think that's a function. 1979, yes it was, that route was given on contract, not to grace it, because when it rains, obviously, and I'm not being selfish here. I mean, as you know, most municipalities, uh, including Hawaii itself, has got gaping holes on those that were constructed much earlier. Thank you.